Uh, so we're very excited this morning to have Paul Leather, who's the Deputy Commissioner from the New Hampshire Department of Education, who's going to be delivering our keynote address, setting the pace. Really, I, I just really want to thank uh, David and uh, Jill and Jessica and uh, Josh and uh, Aubrey and all the folks at uh, uh, the REL and the EDC for really championing high quality uh, research that really can only strengthen the work that so many of us are involved in. I think uh, as I talk to folks across the country, but the single most important thing that this movement needs right now is some really grounded research. So thank you so much for really stepping out in front and, and uh, making that happen and, uh, and having this symposium today and inviting me here. So let me, uh, let me get going here. I uh, have a few minutes. Um, I am going to talk about PACE, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about how New Hampshire got to PACE. Uh, and as I look out here across the room, I recognize that um, you know there are uh, any number of folks sitting out there that could be up here and probably do a better job at this presentation. Uh, maybe not necessarily about pace, but about how competency education has changed the lives of, of students across uh, our schools and across New England and across the country. So I, I do stand here a little bit awed uh, as I look around the room, and it doesn't, you know, when you're as old as dirt like I am, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to have me be odd, but it, it is a, a little nerve wracking. I do want to just recognize just a couple people who I, I put in the pioneer category. Uh, I'm looking at one right now, Kim Carter, who uh, uh, had, uh, ran a little school uh, in Manadnock uh, some years ago and now is running some charter schools in a, in a, uh, a, a, a program for technical assistance across the country as we speak. Uh, the first, uh, one of the very first uh, personalized, customized, if you will, exhibitions of student graduation that I ever saw uh, in great depth happened at her school. And uh, those of us who were there said, this is what we're looking for. And so she, uh, she was one of the very first proof points uh, and created that. Uh, also want to just recognize Marion Buffer sitting right next to her, who's been uh, working with me all along the way at the Department of Education. Uh, since the 90s in uh, moving competency education is uh, so important in, in uh, guiding our work. She now leads the PACE work. And then I also want to recognize my uh, compatriot in arms in uh, uh, New England, David Booth. I think most <coughs> folks here know David very well, uh, the, the leader of the uh, Great Schools Partnership and the New England Secondary School Consortium, really has made this a, a New England-wide effort. And, now, as I understand, even stepping into Massachusetts, right, David? <laughs> Before I go any further, I, I do want to give a couple of quick shout outs uh, regarding a couple of documents. You probably all already have it downloaded and have read it and uh, studied it. One is uh, Reaching the Tipping Point Insights on Advancing Competency Education in New England uh, by Chris Sturgis of INACOL and Competency Works. Uh, just came out a couple days ago. Uh, and, you know, if you really want to know what's going on in New England, take a look at this, and Chris really tries to keep up with, with it all. And then another document, maybe not so well known, but also came out in the last day or two, and it's going to be quite controversial, and I'm going to put it out there because I think uh, it'll start to uh, feed some of the conversation that we'll have around accountability and assessment um, uh, in this environment, and that's assessment matters, constructing model state systems to replace Testing Overkill by Fair Test, National Center for Fair and Open Testing. Uh, they take a pretty strong position, as you're probably not surprised to hear, and uh, uh, I'd be curious to hear what people think of it. Uh, so, I'd like to get right into it. Uh, when our commissioner goes around to talk about competency education, this is really the phrase that she uses. We want confident and competent New Hampshire <coughs> graduates. And you know, it, it really speaks to folks. They, they, they understand what that means. And, you know, it's not just that a student knows what they're doing, but that they, they have this sense of agency around what they're doing. And actually the research truly supports that, that those students who have capability defined as knowledge and the understanding to use it in real work life situations and agency, a deep and durable self in charge of one's learning and development, that's a student who is competent. And, and I'm going to say this a little later, but I want to say it now. 
Isn't that what we're looking for from our graduates? A student who has that, that capability and that sense of confidence. However, we also know that you know, we may be confident and confident in one area, but that might not necessarily transfer to another. So that series of learning and that series of demonstration of confidence is so very important. A classic example of that is the football uh, team captain, right, who's maybe confident at, at tackling and even leading students, but put him in a consumer family science class where he has to hem his, uh, his pants for the upcoming prom and maybe not so confident, at least initially, has to learn a new skill and, and confidence in doing that kind of work. So thinking about confidence and competence, we need to think about how we assess these pieces of, of our new system. Uh, folks may have seen this. This is from a, uh, a blog that Chris Sturgis uh, of Competency Works wrote last December. And uh, folks have probably seen this kind of uh, a framing. Uh, essentially, the, the dark squares are units or competencies where students have mastered the competency, and the lighter, lighter uh, boxes are where perhaps they went through that competency as part of their uh, uh, education, uh, and, but they didn't master, but they kept going. So in a cohort age-based system, that's what we tend to see, right? And so, so typically, in early years, you know, grades three or so, student will go through and pretty much get all the way through. And then in fourth grade, well, they might miss a little bit more, maybe uh, through absence or just didn't quite understand that section, but still picking up most of it. Well, continuing on, uh, missing maybe a little bit more, but you know, still, still uh, passing the grades and right up through sixth grade, still passing and then suddenly hitting middle school. And what do we start to see? We start to see really missing whole large sections. Uh, this is what we often refer to as Swiss cheese education. And uh, the, the holes become more apparent than the learning. And how many of our students have we seen in mathematics, for example, where they've marched along, they seem very capable, they're very engaged students, they get to middle school and suddenly the bottom falls out. And why does that happen? And you know, it's still a mystery to so many folks. Uh, but we always want to think about how our actual system employs, uh, really leads to this kind of an outcome. So we believe that competency education is in fact right for kids, and it represents our core beliefs and our theory of action. And this is a kind of a simple statement of our theory of action, that if we do in fact want each and every student to be college and career ready, then we really need to help them advance through uh, through a series of mastery experiences and, and not have a Swiss cheese uh, learning. But to do that, we need a comprehensive system of support for them, and we need to support our educators in a new way of teaching and learning. And so as a theory of action, you can think about it. This is not something you can employ through the current kind of accountability system, is it? It's not a system where you can just say, well, we're going to test you and we're going to hold you accountable. It means the whole system's got to change and we've got to support educators in a new way of teaching and learning. And so to do that, we really need to have a, a whole different kind of foundation to what we're trying to accomplish. New Hampshire really came to this from this concept of um, our, our aligned vision, where we wanted to move to competency education, but we believe that to do that, it's necessary to support our educators and uh, really to support local innovation. Uh, how many folks in the room know the, the motto for New Hampshire? Live free or die, Live free or die right? <laughs> and uh, we, we mean it in New Hampshire. And so uh, for the State Department to come out and say, thou shalt do this, well, that's an interesting experience. I've been at the head of, <laughs> head of those meetings any number of times. And uh, I can tell you, uh, it, it doesn't work any better in our state than it probably works anywhere else. Uh, if you really want to see deep engagement, let's engage our educators in the effort rather than telling them what to do. So that's how we believe it. And, and once we do that, then we can start to put together an integrated learning system that includes pre-K education, includes K-12 education, includes experiences in the community and the businesses, and includes higher education. So um, this is a, a slide, and I always have to show this uh, 
I, I, how many folks here are familiar with the 51st State Paper by Linda Darling Hammond? A few folks in the room. Linda Darling Hammond and uh, uh, Jean Wilhoyt and Linda Pittenger a couple of years ago put forward a paper called Accountability for College and Career Readiness, uh, Developing a New Paradigm, which really started to establish this idea that many of us have already been talking about, that accountability should not be solely about some of the tests, that it should not be about shaming and blaming. I, I really should let David Roof get up here and talk about that. He does a great grip on that. Let's move away from uh, shaming and blaming. But it really should be about a system that we're most importantly emphasizing improving teaching and learning and school performance, leading to higher quality experiences and better prepared graduates. And this little piece is the, my one piece in that paper, uh, which really talks about moving from an old system that was entirely dominated by summative large scale state assessments to a system that's really more dominated by formative, local, embedded assessments where you might have summative assessments along the way just to check to see if folks are on track. It's a new way to think about assessment and accountability, if you will. And as a part of that, we, we know that there are certain tenets in a new kind of a system. It needs to be reciprocal, and I'll talk about that in a second, but where each level of the system is taking responsibility for its role and contribution, uh, a new system of accountability needs to be coherent and integrative, where, where what's going on at the local level is very consistent and supported of what's going on at the, the school, the district, and the state level. It must really be defined by continuous improvement, and that's a, that's a hard lift in, in public education where change often happens only on an annual basis. Um, it needs to uh, support system capacity development. And what does that really mean? It really means lifting the capacity of our educators going forward. It must provide transparent and accessible information, and that's a trick, particularly when we're talking about multiple assessments. And it must uh, be informed by uh, student, parent, educator, and com community input along the way and feedback as to how well it's working. So talking about uh, uh, reciprocality, uh, Folks are probably familiar with this uh, quote by Richard Elmore in 2006. Accountability must be a reciprocal process. For every expectation I have of you to perform, I have an equal responsibility to provide you with the capacity to meet that expectation. So when I talk about pace, and I will in a second, um, what we did first for two years before we implemented pace is the state provided uh, intensive professional development to teams of educators of those schools and districts that were going to be involved. And for, for districts to join, they must demonstrate that they are ready to join. So it's a new kind of accountability where it's no longer a system where the state comes out and says, here's a state test, we're going to assess you, whether you're ready or not, we're going to hold you accountable to it. It's a new system where you choose to join based on your, your readiness going forward. So um, here's the way uh, the 51st state accountability system looks. Uh, essentially, it's a comprehensive assessment system where you have local assessments uh, by which students demonstrate their, their learning and their growth. And then you have grade span checks along the way and quality assurance systems to demonstrate that uh, the true teaching and learning is going on in the, in the system and that the assessments are, are reliable and valid. And so uh, the PACE system was designed against this model based on this 51st state paper, which was really put together uh, by a, a group of educators and researchers uh, at Stanford University uh, as funded by the Hewlett Foundation and a number of others. So for New Hampshire, our theory of action, if you will, looks like this. Um, I'm going to presume that a number of you have kind of seen or read about PACE, but let's just to recap, it's essentially an assessment and accountability effort in now eight New Hampshire school districts and two charter schools that's been approved uh, by, for a two-year pilot and then we are invited to a third year, going into our third year by the U.S. Department of Education. Districts are assessing student performance in content areas right now in English language arts, math, and science through both smarter balanced and grade spans and by building and assessing students' 
with local and common complex performance tasks in each of these content areas. Although not part of the federal and state uh, system, a number of the PACE districts are also assessing work study practices, arts and social studies through their performance assessments and building really learning uh, environments that are student-centered and personalized and competency-based uh, with the intent that through this assessment and learning experience that students will end up uh, college and career and citizenship ready. So that's our theory act of action. And behind this is the lift for educators um, as, as a part of the effort. So what has in fact changed for uh, with PACE with this new kind of a system? Well, under No Child Left Behind, as I mentioned before, all districts are held accountable at once to a state system and a state test, whereas under PACE, districts must meet guardrails and demonstrate their readiness before joining PACE. That uh, under No Child Left Behind, there's a state level assessment. Uh, the last two were really essentially nationally developed assessments like Smarter Balanced and the, the New England Common Assessment Program or NECAP. Under PACE, the assessments are developed locally and the system is state and local, where they have common uh, PACE uh, complex performance tasks as well as locally developed tasks. In uh, no, no Child Left Behind, the annual determination is based solely on those state assessments. So really have nothing to do necessarily with what goes on in curriculum and instruction and assessments at the local level. Whereas in PACE, local communities <coughs> develop their annual determinations based on multiple measures, and I'm going to share with you what that looks like in a second. Um, under No Child Left Behind, our experience was that there often were two accountability systems. There was the state and federal system, and then the local uh, system. And if you went to a local school board, uh, what you would hear is the superintendent and principals talking to their school board saying, well, here's our, our kneecap or our smarter balance results, but here's what we're really doing to improve teaching and learning. What we're trying to do under PACE is to have local communities and educators own a single system of accountability that includes both state and local assessments. And under No Child Left Behind, educator development is really tied to school improvement activities after the assessment results come in, often a year or more later, uh, well after the teaching and learning and the assessment actually occurred, whereas under PACE, um, intensive educator development occurs prior to joining PACE and continues as PACE involvement uh, develops. So um, I mentioned before that we, under PACE, our, our assessment of, of choice, if you will, our complex performance tasks. This is a, uh, an assessment continuum in terms of uh, narrow assessment to assessments of deeper learning. This was developed by Linda Darling Hammond a few years ago. And essentially, if you think about it, our current uh, uh, state assessments are in this category on the left side, traditional tests and uh, common core state standard assessments. Uh, they're really narrow assessments of, of English language arts and math or uh, of content areas. Whereas if we go to assessments of deeper learning, we're looking at performance-based, extended performance-based, and student design projects uh, going forward. We wanted to push this as far to the the, the left side of this chart is possible because we believe for a student to demonstrate college and career readiness, they need to demonstrate those deeper, those, that deeper learning. So this is what uh, the PACE assessment uh, uh, bank looks like, um, where we uh, actually, and this is what's been approved by the U.S. Department of Education, where we're giving Smarter Balance, which is in red, in once in elementary, if you will, once in middle school and then the SAT in high school. And then in intervening grades, we have common pace performance-based assessments as well as local performance-based assessments. And then we run a series of comparability studies with the National Center for Assessment, which, share, which is able to demonstrate the comparability between the local and the state and the common assessments as a, as a whole um, a set of uh, indices. And, uh, we've now done this for two years, and we feel pretty good about how this works out from a psychometric standpoint. Um, looking a little deeper, here's a, a look at classroom uh, assessments uh, as well as district and state assessments. And so this is uh, for uh, um, uh, mathematics. And uh, so in, I'm sorry, in uh, 
grade uh, five, um, you can see they're taking a PACE, uh, a, a common performance assessment. They might also have a local district assess assessment, in this case NWEA, but then they have local uh, performance assessments also, as well as unit assessments. All of this, and then a, a local performance assessment as well, all of this is rolled up into a single uh, uh, determination for math for a student at that grade level. So it's really a combination, a body of work of assessment that leads to an annual determination. The, the local and, I'm sorry, the state and uh, the common PACE assessments are really calibration tools to make sure that the grading that's going on against all of these assessments is fair, reliable, and valid. This is uh, really the kind of how the system actually works, where we have local performance assessments that lead to competency determinations, that lead to district level competency scores, and are checked by PACE common performance tasks, and Smarter Balance and SAT and grade spans, which lead to annual comparable annual determinations under PACE. So remember that PACE was approved in the in the latter days of No Child Left Behind, we had to meet state and federal requirements uh, under No Child Left Behind, but we did it in a very, very different way. Under ESSA, one questions, do we have to meet the same set of standards? The whole issue of comparability is a, a huge conversation. What is the purpose of accountability? Must we demonstrate, uh, and how rigorously must we demonstrate comparability of students learning in English language arts, math, or science from school A to school X. So how does our, how does our accountability system work and what are our expectations of it? That's a big conversation that needs to happen. We believe that some of the answer to that question is, is been informed by international research. I don't know how many folks are familiar with uh, the Learning First uh, report by Ben Jensen, Professional Learning and High Performing Systems. He presented it at a recent uh, National Center for Education and the Economy uh, conference in January of uh, this, this year. Uh, and he talked about professional learning links uh, with school accountability and how districts need to be tight with evaluating school learning, instructional improvement, and the quality of professional learning, just as we've talked about in accountability uh, in, in this country, but it may require a different emphasis on accountability, a change in measures, and most importantly, a greater reliance on professional development and systems of support for educators. And perhaps that's where we have not, in our country, placed as much emphasis. So I thought it's important to touch on that because I feel if there's a place where research is really needed, it's what is the role of the educator and what is the educator's experience and, and capacity level, if you will, capability, competence in, in teaching and learning, and, and how does that relate to student performance over time. The way we think about that in PACE is that what we've seen for, with our districts, those have been the highest performing, the most uh, uh, continually improving, have these high performing professional learning communities that are really characterized by uh, having a review of their competency expectations on a regular basis, where they evolve their instructional practice based on the students that they're working with, where they're developing strategies to enhance the personalization of that learning experience, and where student agency is at the core. I think in a few minutes, uh, when we hear from the students, uh, I know from folks from Pittsville, for example, we will hear about student agency. We will see student agency in action, and that is critical to how this system can work. Um, and that we're looking to improve our assessment system over time uh, through educators reviewing actual student work by themselves, but also with other educators and across schools and across districts, so that there's a real sense as to when we say quality, when we say proficiency, we know what we mean when we say that. Right now in New Hampshire, uh, in our first year, 2014-15, we had uh, uh, these uh, four districts uh, in, in the uh, pilot, Rochester, Sanborn Regional, Epping, and Salhegan High School. Um, we additionally, in year two, we added Concord, Monroe, Pittsfield, and Seacoast Charter School. And then this year, we added 
SAU 35 White Mountains was way up north, a number of communities, and the Virtual Learning Academy. And we, we would have added another few uh, districts, but uh, in our negotiation with the U.S. Department of Education uh, this year, they wanted us to hold here, and Commissioner Barry actually had to kind of force the issue just to bring these couple more in. As you can see, we have a number of districts sitting there waiting to, to jump into the system. So if folks are asking, is this a scalable system? Yes, it is scalable, and I think our experience is folks see it as high value and they want to help move that. So as we talk about scaling, though, we believe there needs to be a system for scaling. And we have three tiers, planning, preparing, and implementing. And, and uh, planning, we're really helping schools think about and implement competency education, providing technical assistance and other supports in doing that, having them involved in networks with other schools in, in implementation. Under uh, preparing, they are learning how to build performance tasks, to score them, uh, go through calibration and scoring practices. And then in implementation, uh, they, they are actually holding themselves accountable and the state is holding them accountable based on, on the system that I've shared with you. And there's a number of in-state and state uh, national partners that are supporting this, the Center for Collaborative Education and uh, the National Center for Assessment, uh, most in particular. So getting back to this definition, competence is really the sense that uh, knowledge and the understanding and the use of it in real life situations, capability, and agency, a deep and durable self in charge of one's learning and development is, is what we need. And I think that our sense is our business community uh, is, is asking for this, our parents are asking for this, uh, higher education is asking for this, and uh, when Marion and I first started working with those partners in, in the 1990s, we heard it loud and clear and we continue to hear it today. And that's why we've built this system and why we think it's a system for the future. Um, in summary, I would say we have a big challenge in front of us. Know that we feel that we've been able to demonstrate as one proof point that we can have collaborative capacity building and it can be successful. That we can build a system with reciprocal accountability. That we can demonstrate cross-district calibration. We're not the only folks who have done that, but we have done it in our system. That we have built annual determinations that stand up to uh, the, the kinds of accountability expectations, even under No Child Left Behind. And we have improved assessment quality along the way. We believe the implications for the future are huge, that this innovation assessment and accountability demonstration uh, authority makes is essentially open the doors so that others can walk through this and won't be under such a stringent review going forward. Will there be a review? Yes, there will. I hope that the research community will help us establish what works, what's quality, and also what doesn't work. Uh, but with that said, I think we're facing a new era for public education. Thank you. I went through that pretty quickly knowing uh, uh, time uh, is, is limited here, but. Are there questions? Uh, obviously, I've not shared the entire system with you, uh, but I kind of hit the highlights. Hi, I've got a question that might be sort of specific. I noticed the SAT on your slides for 11th grade. Can you go to the microphone? I'm not loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> you might regret putting it Hi, I'm Lori McEwen. I'm from Rhode Island. Stand um, up. Yeah, I'm standing as high as I can. I noticed SAT on one of your slides when you were talking about the system in 11th grade. Did you also explore, or are you using in any of those eight schools in the two charters, PSAT 8-9 and PSAT 10 as a system? Actually, when we submitted for our, our pilot, we actually submitted that as an alternative. Not every school wanted to do PACE. They were thinking of a more traditional model like that. Uh, but the U.S. Department of Education re rejected it. Uh, we're, we're, when we come back with our 1204 authority, it's possible we will request it again. Thank you. you folks might want to get in line. I, uh, so we, uh, I, yeah, I was uh, looking, I'm pretty for this from Boston. Yeah. 
I was looking at your framework and I had a question on the accountability matrix. When you're referring to competency, there are two dynamics that we look at in competency-based frameworks. We're either looking at standards or power standards, or we're looking at benchmarks to inform the assessment criteria. Which of the two are you looking in the infrastructure of your systems? Because they vary deeply. Well, but, uh, you know, language is always a little different from one place to another, but what we have done is constructed a series of competencies, K through 12, uh, which are based on national standards, but are not identical to the national standards. And we particularly emphasize, we took a, took a, a, a crosswalk that was constructed actually by Stanford University and Linda Darling Hammond, of those, kind, those standards that really require for, for, for a true assessment uh, a deeper, more complex performance assessment of uh, expectation. You answered my question by using that. that those are referred to as power standards. Marzano look, looks at that in the evaluation framework. Hi, I'm, I'm Beth Rabbit with the Learning Accelerator. I'm curious about how you assess as to when districts are actually ready to enter the, um, the implementation stage. What are the practices you look for in the competency at the institutional level that lets you feel confident they're ready? <laughs> Well, we're, we're um, we, first we ask, do they want to come in? And when we ask that, we ask, does the leadership want to come in? Does their board want them to come in? Uh, have they talked to their community? Do they have grading practices where they've communicated with their community? And most importantly, do their educators want to come in? And we want, we're not looking just there for a declaration. We want them to demonstrate that by showing us that they have been involved in the development of performance tasks, of implementing them in their classroom, and uh, a competency-based system. That they have, in fact, developed competencies at the local level and implemented them and are using them in their, their teaching and learning practices. Uh, there are a number of other pieces, including uh, that there's a, a statement of, of support at the district and, and uh, uh, school board level that they will support the kinds of professional development and change that will need to occur. Uh, because our experience is if they don't do those things, they won't be successful, it will not be a good experience for them. So those are the main ones. There are, are a number of others, and I would point you to Marianne Graffer, who kind of put that whole list together if you want to get the full list. Anybody else? Consulting group. Um, can you talk about what role systems play, information systems, particularly software and technology? Um, it seems from the description here that it, om it almost seems like it's a paper based system, but as you know, that's a lot of information to manage on each kid, on each competency. At the state level and at the district level, what role are information systems playing? Well, we, we have a pretty basic uh, system, uh, SIS system, where we we collect uh, data coming out of the uh, district um, uh, systems. We do not have an, uh, uh, a well-established uh, LMS. That's actually the work we're doing this year. Uh, we're trying to create an integrated system. Uh, so we know that we cannot scale this work, uh, particularly in our larger districts, without that. And we also recognize that, uh, and this will be talked about later, but. You know, there's a lot of talk in, in uh, competency education about personalization and moving on when ready, but I think our experience is it's tough to move away from cohort-driven instruction without those systems in place. And so we want to be able to support our educators in doing that. You're absolutely right. I usually one other thing, which is that it's interesting because I spend most of my time in the room with technology vendors who are looking at this same space. It's just so interesting that it's almost an entirely different people and conversation happening and the need is now to bring those together. IMS Global has this new competency framework task force that is working on technical specifications for exchange competency frameworks. It needs to be informed more by the educators in this room. Great. The one thing I would say, and I, I'm just going to show my bias and to some degree my age in this statement, but what the thing we did shy away from is sticking kids in front of the computer and having them march along uh, kind of prefab uh, curriculum and instruction, uh, demonstrating their learning along the way. We wanted to have a deeper, richer 
uh, kind of experience where students and educators were truly engaged. And we want to use the, the tech systems to support that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, uh, I think that may be it. Thank you, everyone.